All right. Let's see how we start here. Has anyone here seen the Black Panther? Hmm? Who hasn't seen it? You all go see it. <laughs> Why do I start there? Well, the Black Panther became a phenomenon last year in the United States because it was supposed to be the first black Superman, right? And didn't he look cool? You know, for those who haven't seen him, all his soldiers and generals are ladies. Mm. He listens to his sister and his mama, and his sister is the one who makes the suits that give him superpowers. Remember that in the film? Yeah. But anyone who lives in the United States probably also noticed that he was, despite of his superpowers, not able to save his African-American cousin here in the United States. In fact, that becomes his enemy. So Superman, T'Challa, T'Challa from Wakanda, <laughs> oh, well, he did not come to the United States to save African-Americans from discrimination and oppression, definitely not. So, well, apparently, and that drew me to Marie Laveau, um, as a scholar, and I'm the only scholar here on this panel, as a scholar who taught world religions for 25 years, and yeah, one who teaches at a university and is surrounded by people who are usually as boring as can be, except for Dr. Michael White. <laughs> um, Academia is a place by itself, and there's a little drumming and little dancing and little, little for the senses in the academic teaching of religion. So uh, Marie Laveau was interesting for me from the beginning, uh, not only because I had a spiritual attraction to her, but as an academic, I thought, the combination of mysticism and resistance was very interesting. The stories, the most popular stories about her, and yes, we had already 200 years ago, a black superwoman here in town. The stories about Marie Laveau are about her power, about a woman who could do anything she wanted. So we have all these stories, and I thought that was cool. There were stories of she mesmerizing the police, she turning the police in, you know, um, they, they, the eyewitnesses said they were looking like dogs barking on their knees. So <laughs> uh, we have like amazing stories about her. And maybe I'm gonna quote one that I like in particular. Um, that is by the first black, Af uh, black American uh, anthropologist, Zora Neale Hurston. She was the first one who thought that conjure, the study of conjure, is important, and Marie Laveau in many ways is a conjurer. Well, um, she has this story that she attributes to her teacher, and she said her teacher was a nephew of Marie Laveau. So here's the quote. The police hear so much about Marie Laveau that they come to her house on St. Anne Street to put her in jail. First one come, she stretch out her left hand and he turn around and round and round and never stop until someone come to lead him away. Then two come together. She put them to running and barking like dogs. Four come and she put them to beating each other with nightsticks. The whole police station force come. They knock at her door. She knew who they are before she ever looked. She did walk on her altar, and they all went to sleep on her doorstep. <laughs> so this is just one example. There's another famous example. Uh, there's many eyewitnesses like that. Congo Square, our beloved Congo Square, that in the world is sacred ground. Congo Square uh, was under the French and the Spanish pretty much ac accessible to anyone who wanted to join. But when we came American, drums were terrible. Uh, Anglo-Protestants think drums are bad. Sing singing and dancing is bad. Doesn't make any money. And having fun is also bad. So um, they wanted to shut it down. Of course, they couldn't. But they changed one thing. 
Before anyone could join, afterwards only enslaved people who had a pass from their owner that they had permission to go, could go and join. They put a fence around Congo Square, had police in every corner. Well, everybody in town knew Marie Laveau. She was the most famous fever nurse. She cured more people of yellow fever than anyone else. She was a very good Catholic, went to Holy Mass every morning, but the whole town believed that she had uncanny spiritual powers. And the whole town believed that whatever she says will come true. So it was, um, you know, uh, we have all kinds of stories that when she went to the market, everyone, black and white, would just fall on their knees and let her pass because they were all scared whatever comes to, whatever she says will come to. So they thought she was a nice lady because voodoo, in the voodoo culture, voodoo religion, people uh, generally believe that if you do something bad, it'll come nine times back to you. So that she was saying or doing anything bad wasn't likely, but her powers were so uncanny that they all went out of her way because you never know, you know, you might just be in her way and she puts it a uh, spell on you and might just die of a heart attack the next day. So they were all afraid of her. So the stories of about Congo Square are that she, she went uh, to the gate and there were police officers, four police officers at each gate, and she just hypnotized them and walked straight in. And then all the crowds were drumming and, and applauding her, and they say she always danced first. And there are stories that she was the best dancer in the whole city. So apparently she combined being a good Catholic, she was a mulatta, so she had French ancestors, she had African ancestors. And in the morning, she went to the French Catholic Church. In the afternoon, she paid tribute to her African ancestors and she danced on Congo Square. And also there is a snake involved. Um, that she is attributed to her. It's called Le Grand Zombie. Um, it helps to understand Congo mythology because uh, the word zombie comes from, from uh, uh, zombie. This, in Haiti, it is somebody that was given a poison and then buried alive and then awoken again and has to work for the person who poisoned him for the rest of his life. So it's a very traumatic experience. But uh, Le Grand Zombie, the snake that Marie Laveau has, uh, had, had probably much more with Congo Catholicism uh, that her grandmother was practicing. Um, in the Congo, the python has nothing to do with the devil. In the Congo, the python is a symbol of the heavens, the kingdom of heavens. So the stories, when Marie Laveau was dancing with a python, her python, Le Grand Zombie, which means nothing else but God Almighty. Zambi, Wapungo means nothing but God Almighty. So when she was dancing with the snake in Congo Square, we know now she was basically telling the people who were enslaved, the kingdom of heaven will come to you. That's what she was saying. And uh, the people, the Congo Square was kind of a strange place. There were the enslaved people having a party. African style, but it was also a tourist attraction. There were white folks around it staring at it. And I'm pretty sure they got the wrong idea of what Marilla was saying. They said, oh, devil worship, she's the devil's lady, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but that gives you a good understanding of um, the role of the conjurer. The role of the conjurer is a person who can transform reality. And we have endless stories of conjurers. They, of course, conjure is the wrong word for it because they were holy men, holy women, who had magical spiritual powers similar to the saints in Europe, similar to the great Sufis in Islamic traditions, similar to any holy person we have in any tradition. So we have endless stories about the great power of Marie Laveau. Now my challenge when I first worked on her was to separate the stories from the reality. Because besides the magical stories about Marie Laveau, there was an actual person who lived in New Orleans, who was born on September 10th, 1801. It took me 15 years to find that, but I found it. Um, she died, everybody knew that. 
she died uh, June 15, 1881. Why everybody knew that? There were obituaries literally in every newspaper we had. And get this, the first obituary on her that I found was in the New York Times. Filled almost the entire page, second page of the New York Times. Now one of my graduate teachers at Temple University, uh, Katie Cannon, the great Katie Cannon, a, a womanist ethicist, she always told me, if anyone makes it into the New York Times, that person is important. So, <laughs> so Marie Laveau was definitely very, very important. Um, but the stories of her invincible powers, that she could turn any fate around, that she could control the whole city, that she could do whatever she wanted, was apparently not true when you read the documents. Uh, Marie Laveau did not have an easy life. Um, it was it was tough at times. It was uh, really difficult because from day one she was between families. She was born into one family but was actually the product of another family. Her parents were both given to someone else. She's a fling, the result of a fling between her parents. So it was always tough for her and she was probably always called to a place where she had to rely on her spirits, her spirit guides, because she couldn't, probably couldn't rely on people around her. And when a child is challenged beyond their capacity, they either die or they become powerful. And in her case, she was able to transform it and could use the powers that were given to her to heal and to help so many people that the whole city and beyond the city, I found stories in Cuba, in New York. There's a whole church movement of the Church of Marie Laveau in South America. There is uh, teachings of her in Haiti. Uh, she's really not just confined to New Orleans. Her fame went way beyond uh, the city. But this lady <coughs> had her tribulations and her, her difficulties. And so in my research, I started to look into the real person the historical Marie Laveau, and the mythological person. Because Marie Laveau is at the same time a real person who lived in New Orleans, who's buried in that tomb that now gets 10,000 visitors every day, minimum. Um, she's really buried in there. And her, when she died, there were thousands of people following her tomb because she had, almost in every family, she had helped someone to survive or, uh, or someone's dad or mom or child. So she was a really wonderful person. Um, but there were also people who were jealous and from day one said, this is a charlatan, she's evil. Mainly doctors because she could heal people that they couldn't heal. For one thing, our doctors didn't wash their hands in the 19th century. So please, you know, she did. And she had herbal remedies that were far, far better than what they had. So uh, when somebody's successful, some people get jealous and want to destroy her. So already during her lifetimes, there were really bad stories about her. And um, they got worse during the Jim Crow era. So much so that um, people started not talking about her because they were scared of that monster that developed in the Jim Crow era. When I first came to New Orleans, I was in a train full of young people, all from New Orleans, and I asked all of them, there were hundreds of them, but coming from Philadelphia to New Orleans in a train, you have a lot of time to ask people. <laughs> so um, none of them had heard of Marie Laveau. That's in the mid-80s. Well, thank you, Dr. Feinrich. That's You're different welcome. today, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, I have to end. You can tell I can talk about Marie Laveau for a long time, but I have to end here. So thank you for listening. She was, at the same time, the key figure of our voodoo tradition here, born and raised in New Orleans, and at the same time, staff of much of our mythology. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're going to have to move on.